Good evening, this is What's Going On. I'm John Lee. Our guest this evening is Brett Lee, the newly elected mayor pro tem of the city of Davis. Brett, I want to thank you for being on our show. Uh, thanks for having me, John. Absolutely. So we're in experimental mode here. I'm, uh, I've recruited Zoe Vickstrom to be the co-editor, and so I'm going to make an initial statement that I've been wanting to stay, say for a long time. Then Zoe's going to introduce Brett and interview Brett, and then we're, Brett and I are going to have a little conversation about the future of Davis at the end. So um, I've been wanting to say this for a long time. Seven years ago, Lois Wolk and I had lunch, and she asked me about her son being on the Davis City Council, and I said, I don't think he's got the fire in his belly, and I don't think he does. I don't think he should have been in elected office. So I'm going to tell a very brief story and try and make my point. If you take two uh, seeds and germinate them and put one in a pot that's outside and one in a pot that's inside and then let them grow and then after a while put the inside pot outside, as soon as there's a wind, the outside pot will not fall over, but the inside plant will. And so that's basically what happened to Dan Walk was when he was on the city council, he really didn't learn how to do what it takes to be on the city council. And so one of the things that he advocated, and I'm making this really brief, I'm not filling in all my details. One of the things that he advocated very strongly was the sugar tax on soda. And then he got three two other members of the city council to agree with him. And then he brought it to the city council. And then the next week, all the merchants were in the audience, and he had never faced opposition before, and he completely caved in. And a week after that, the special interests in Sacramento spent $2 million to make sure that he did not get elected to the assembly. So. The Davis learning experience in the last five years has been incredible. The person who has benefited from that the most is Brett Lee. Brett Lee, five years ago, was an unknown person that Dick Livingston was coaching to run for the Davis City Council. Five people ran for three seats. Dan Wolk, for sure, was number one. Lucas Freyricks, for sure, was number two. Incumbent Sue Greenwald and Stephen Souza that made Brett Lee number five. Brett Lee had to earn every single vote he got four years ago, and he did. Brett Lee came in third. To his credit, he's worked full time. He's raising his son. He's active in the civic affairs that are his responsibility. As a candidate for reelection, he ran the second best campaign I have ever seen in the city of Davis. In, the 30 years that we've done this show. In 1982, Ann Evans and her campaign with John Ma Smith, as her campaign manager, walked the entire city of Davis one and a half times. That is the only campaign, and they had a fundraiser once a week. That is the only campaign that was better than Brett's campaign. Brett met with people on a regular basis, went out of his way to do everything he could to be a viable member of the city council. I am really impressed with the campaign that Brett ran, and I'm going to be really interested to hear what he has to say. So he's going to do the interview. Thanks for being on our show. Hi, my name is Zoe Vickstrom, and we are here today with Brett Lee. He is a City of Davis Council member and an engineer. Thanks for being here today, Brett. Oh, thanks, Zoe. Thanks for having me. So let's start off with um, you telling me a little bit about yourself and your position. Oh, OK. So I'm uh, currently on the City Council. I um, was recently reelected in June, so I have another almost four years to go. Uh, I've lived in Davis off and on my entire life. Uh, my grandparents moved here originally uh, in the 40s. And on my uh, campaign website, I listed that I was a third generation uh, Davisite. So grandparents, uh, my mom went to school here, went to Davis High, Davis High grad, ultimately graduated from UC Davis, and then of course me. And then, mm -hmm. so I have a son who's the fourth generation. But it's actually kind of funny. Uh, 
a few weeks ago, I was talking to my grandfather, who's uh, still alive, he's 98, and I was thinking, wait, I remember that on 8th Street, uh, my uncle and I helped paint my uh, great-grandmother's house. And he said, yeah, you know, she had a house there. And I thought, well, wait, so if she lived <laughs> in Davis, does that mean instead of a third generation, I'm actually the fourth generation and Jasper's the fifth? And so it is, uh, so I've been in Davis for a while. My family has been here for a while. Nobody in my family has been involved with local politics, uh, just sort of just kind of going about our daily lives and, you know, okay. volunteer here and there, uh, but, but not really involved in political life. Uh, I think uh, for me, how I ended up on the city council is I was pretty uh, uh, volunteered on the No on Measure X, the No on Coville Village uh, activities back in, I guess that was 2004-ish. Uh, and then I got to meet a lot of the people involved in local politics, and then sort of one thing led to another, and then eight or so years later, I decided to run for city council. Wow. That's a so little bit So you have lots me. of experience in Davis. Uh, yeah, fair amount, yeah. Um, so you work for Farm Fresh to You. Yes. Can you describe what you do there? So I'm a process improvement engineer. Okay. And so prior to Farm Fresh to You, I worked at FedEx. I worked as an engineer for FedEx Express. And there I was really focused on productivity and efficiency. At Farm Fresh to You, I look a little bit at productivity and efficiency, but I would say my main role is gathering data and analyzing it in a way so that people can make decisions from it. Because we have a, a lot of data available to us, uh, you know, who our customers are, what types of produce they like, um, and then things is uh, related to like how does that produce do? So, for instance. You know, we're getting a lot of complaints about apples, like apples, uh, you know, not <laughs> tasting as nice as they should. And so you investigate and, you know, try to figure out what's going on uh, in terms of uh, the product we offer. So really, I would say that my goal is to improve uh, the product that we deliver to people's homes. So it's an organic produce box. It's kind of like a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, type of system. But rather than people having to go and get their box, we actually deliver it. And one of the things that we do, which is a little bit unique, but adds a whole level of complexity, is you're able to customize. So the typical CSA box would be, okay, the farm packs up this box and all the boxes are the same. And you just kind of go and you grab your box. Uh, we allow people to say, well, I don't really want kale this week. I think I'd rather have a double order of celery or something like that. Or I don't want celery, I just want extra oranges. Because of that, each box potentially is sort of customized to that individual. And so rather than making, you know, 100 boxes all the same, we have to be able to individually package the box based upon what the customer's preference is. Okay. And about how many customers do you have? Is this a local company or is it? Yeah, it's local. So the farm, the main farm is in um, the Cape Hay Valley. Okay. And it was started by the current owner's parents uh, in the 80s. Uh, they were UCD students and they went uh, there and they bought a piece of land and they were, you know, kind of like the hippie back to earth. Uh, uh, kind of movement and they created this organic farm and then we also have some land in Southern California uh, in the Imperial Valley and the reason we have that is so that there's a greater selection so in the winter you're not limited to just what could be grown uh, in close proximity but it's um, all the food is organic and all the food is local at some uh, to some extent mainly uh, sort of local to Northern California or Southern California because uh, some people want a little more variety, you know, we'll uh, sometimes have like Washington apples or you know, Oregon apples or things like that. So we do, okay. do that, but there's nothing imported. It's all sort of uh, kind of West Coast product. Right. And what made you decide to go into engineering in this specific job? Like, what about engineering are you interested in? Yeah, uh, so they're sort of separated by a large time frame. Yeah. <laughs> Being a little bit older. Uh, when I was in high school, I think, like many kids, if you were good at math and science, they said, oh, you should be an engineer. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I felt like I was good at math and science. And so <laughs> that kind of gave me a little push towards that career field. I, I think it's a little bit interesting because I was also good at all the other subjects. I, I had pretty good grades uh, for, for whatever reason. 
So if somebody had said, well, you're good in history, or you're good in English, or you're good in, you, you know, oh, you should. To be a history major. Uh, well, potentially, <laughs> but it, um, kind of the way it worked, maybe back then, and maybe the way it still works is if you're kind of good at math and science, they say, oh, well, you should be an engineer. Okay. Uh, I originally started as a civil engineer at uh, Berkeley, and I thought I had this vision of myself working uh, overseas, building like large uh, airports or dams or big road projects. Uh, and that was a fairly typical, that was a real possible career path um, in the 80s, early 80s. That sort of went away because a lot of the countries overseas started to have their own engineers and own construction companies. So mm -hmm. in the early 80s, uh, Bechtel was this sort of this civil engineering company that would go. And you, if you lived in Peru and you needed a dam built, well, you'd pick up the phone and call Bechtel, and they'd come and build this you know, very large project. So my freshman year, I sort of looked around and realized those jobs were disappearing. And then I changed to uh, industrial engineering in operations research, which is uh, uh, applied math, applied statistics. It's sort of a problem solving, uh, productivity and efficiency. And um, I think John and I talked about this maybe four years ago when I first uh, was on this show. Um, it kind of grew out of World War II. And what it is, it's when you have a scarcity of resources and you have some objective, how do you best use those resources? And so one of the examples early on in terms of operations research is from World War II, where in England they had very limited resources in terms of uh, you know, uh, uh, manpower, in terms of mm -hmm. you know, people to fight in the army, in terms of the actual metals and various other things. And so do you build uh, airplanes or you build a ship? Ship takes way more resources, but you know, if it takes 20 times more resources to build the ship compared to the airplane, What's the, the better thing to do with your resources? And so it tried to come up with uh, a way of systematically analyzing those types of questions. And so that's a little bit of the background of the operations research side of things. So in answer to your question, in high school, didn't really have a concept of what engineering would be like. But when I got to college, uh, I thought I had an idea. And I watched as that sort of career path I had envisioned sort of narrowed. So I switched to something else, which seemed like it would be fairly interesting. And it was. And so in relation to Farm Fresh to you, you know, 20 or 30 years later after graduating, uh, it just sort of continues with that uh, kind of line of work, which is looking at systems and figuring out how we can uh, best improve them. And sometimes it's uh, trying to reduce costs. Sometimes it's trying to improve quality. Sometimes it's a mix of both. OK, and it brought you back to Davis, right? It did. <laughs> Um, so what's your favorite thing about Davis? What do you like about living here? Uh, I like the fact that I don't have to get in a car to go run an errand. And, uh. and this, <laughs> this may seem like, uh, well, for some people, they, they get that, right? You, you say that, and they're like, oh, OK, yeah, I got it. Other people, they're kind of like, yeah, what's the big deal? You just get in your car, you go drive somewhere. What's mm -hmm. the big deal about that? Having lived in Los Angeles for a while, um, there is something nice about just hopping on your bike and being able to go downtown and just uh, go and get something to eat or run a quick errand. There's something, when you're on your bike, for, at least for me and in Davis with bike paths and things like that, it's a fairly relaxed experience. I've ridden my bike in other cities like in London and it's a uh, high adrenaline adventure sport. Just, you know, going from point A to point B <laughs> because yeah. of the traffic and just uh, you're sort of at 100% uh, at attention so you don't get squished. But in Davis, yeah, I think that's really one of the nice things about it. And I also appreciate the weather. Uh, I know it's very hot in the summer, but it's um, dependably sunny and warm. I've lived places where if you say, hey, Zoe, you know, let's go play tennis next Wednesday, you have no idea whether it's going to be rainy or what the weather's going to be like. In Davis, once you hit May, you can pretty much, you know, Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed until uh, the end of September that if you make a plan to do something outdoors, it's probably going to be suitable for doing something outdoors. So uh, I appreciate those two things. Okay. Have you ever ridden your bike through UC Davis campus when <laughs> in session? Yes. Because I found that riding um, my bike through there is a little bit like going, riding through a zoo. <laughs> Have you noticed that? The start of the term, 
start of the fall term, there's always uh, a fair number of people who are newish to bikes or yeah. rediscovering bikes. But in general, I think the infrastructure is laid out well enough, and if you sort of pay attention, it's it's still pretty relaxed. It's nowhere near uh, the level of attention required, say, of uh, driving. At least that's my experience. Okay. And what has been your experience raising your son in Davis? Uh, positive. So when I was a kid, uh, I really enjoyed going to the parks and playing soccer in the fields and going to the rec pool. Uh, it's nice, you know, all these years later, to be able to do some of the same things with my son. So, um, um, so I spent part of my life uh, growing up in San Francisco. In San Francisco, my schoolyard literally had no plant life. Oh, it's just oh, all no. asphalt, right? And so it was fun. You played four square and tetherball and kickball. I mean, there's all sorts of things. But there really wasn't any plant life. Uh, Golden Gate Park was nearby, so I'd go play there. But in Davis, you know, we're really fortunate. You know, kids can go and they can run and play in the fields. They can do, play tag. They can do whatever. Uh, my, my son went to uh, uh, Redbud Montessori, and they have this great tree that all the kids climb. And so, yeah, raising a kid in Davis is actually pretty nice. And I'm very appreciative of uh, the fact that we have a nice school system and that we also have the community that does a lot of volunteer work to make things nice for kids and families. Yeah. Yeah, I've really enjoyed my experience growing up in Davis. Yeah, you must have experienced uh, a lot of those same types of things. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of parent involvement in schools, which I appreciate. Not as a kid, but I appreciate it now, looking, right. <laughs> looking back on it. Um, and what you said about being in nature and just being able to run around. Yeah. And it's a safe place in Davis, yeah. so you're, you're, it's safe to run around. So that's been nice. Yeah. Uh, what projects are you currently involved with in the city council? So one of the, the big things that we're working on, which is uh, kind of a, it's complex. It's a... Uh, and ultimately, depending on how it moves forward, will probably be slightly controversial, which is dealing with the homelessness issue. Oh, okay. And the homelessness issue, I think a lot of times people like to sort of do this quick black and white type of thing. Right? And the homelessness issue is so complex because there's so many reasons why we have people sort of living out on the streets or yeah. you know behind buildings or in you know behind trees and things some of it is self uh, you know some people like a nomadic lifestyle some have lost their job and it's an mm -hmm. economic thing some have addiction issues some have mental health issues and i think the key thing to think about is that you know these are people and they ended up in this situation for a variety of reasons and so there isn't going to be one simple solution right so if people end up in a situation for a variety of reasons. There's probably not the one simple answer. And so that's going to take some hard work. And unfortunately, for some of these issues, like you know, imagine uh, addiction issues or mental health mm -hmm. issues, it requires uh, resources for counseling and things like that. And that can be pretty expensive. And so I think a lot of communities in California and also across the nation are, are dealing with this issue. And so I'm not sure how we're going to address it. I know that we have uh, some city staff people working on it, and it's definitely on the minds of the council people. One thing that's actually coming up that I've been working on for close to three years is our renter's ordinance. So we're hoping to actually have the final vote on a renter's ordinance probably in mid-November to, mid to early December. We have a situation in Davis where there's a vacancy rate of under half a percent. And uh, we have a situation where a third of the single family homes are actually rental properties. And so right now we don't really have a comprehensive approach to uh, dealing with uh, rental issues. And so what we're planning on is having something which has an education component. So landlords, tenants, and neighbors kind of know what the rules are, what the laws are. Um, a mediation component, so if there are any uh, issues, right? So currently, there's not too much you can do other than sort of jump to small claims court. And so the idea is with uh, mediation services, uh, which would be provided by a local nonprofit for essentially almost nothing. Uh, there are volunteers who staff this mediation uh, group, Yellow Conflict Resolution Center. Uh, 
we can work out these disagreements between roommates, right? So roommate issue can be, oh, well, I was just here for two months. I don't think I should pay a share of the rent, even though I kind of said I would. And then you have this weird dynamic, and yeah. one is a friend of the other roommates, and just <laughs> you're like, you just need somebody to just kind of step in, just hear people, and then kind of work something out. And then you have disputes between the landlord and the tenant. Um, right. And those are probably more typical, but having somebody who can come in who's well trained on what uh, the real estate, uh, in terms of what the rental regulations are, and sort of mediate the situation. And, okay. um, and then, sort of, a third component would be an uh, inspection piece, especially uh, really just for single family residential units that are rental properties. Uh, sometimes people uh, do a very good job at keeping their place in good repair and are very prompt with uh, making repairs if something breaks, and sometimes not so much, right? And so this component would be an important piece so people would understand what is sort of uh, the basic level of repair uh, for something to be suitable for renting out. Okay. And so, yeah, we've been doing a lot of outreach with uh, landlords, property owners, and also some of the student groups trying to come up with a workable solution which uh, tries to avoid a lot of unintended consequences. So that'll be coming up pretty soon. And okay. then those are sort of two big ones, and I would say, Number one focus for me is sort of, number one, if not number one, it's definitely in the top three, is trying to figure out a way to repair our roads and bike paths. Right, which uh, is what the Nishi project was in part partly, for, right? Partly that would have uh, helped with some of our infrastructure needs uh, okay. in terms of around uh, traffic congestions and con traffic congestion and, and things like that. Okay, and since that didn't pass, it, are there new plans being drawn up? to sort of um, redesign what that project was meant for? Um, I've met with the project proponents, and as far as I know, there's nothing planned in the near okay. future. Okay. So um, I think they're, I think understandably, I think it's always, you know, when you put a lot of time and energy into an election and you are unsuccessful, it's kind of understandable that they're probably just taking a breather just to yeah. figure out what their next steps will be. But as of now, I, I don't know of any plans for that uh, project. Okay. Um, can you tell me about your experience with the Gandhi statue and the protests? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can actually. So um, last February, uh, at a city council meeting where that was the last council meeting where we could place something on the June ballot. Okay. We were planning to talk about revenue measures. So each of the council people, well, most of the council people had their own sort of pet ideas for uh, a possible revenue measure. So one of mine was maybe a parcel tax for $20 to fund three additional police officers. Somebody else wanted to talk about some infrastructure for uh, recreational faci facilities and uh, parks and you know, those sorts of things. So this, this, was, uh, the, this was the, as we approached the meeting, this is what we were gearing up for. This was kind of like the last meeting to discuss our competing ideas for this. And so that was uh, on the main part of our agenda. And the agenda has essentially two parts. We have the main part, which are the items that we take individually, where there's individual public comment around that issue. And then there's something called the consent calendar. And on the consent calendar, these are items which are described as non-controversial, not likely to need uh, any additional information, and likely to pass 5-0. Uh, okay. So this, there could be 5 to 25 different items on the consent calendar. So for instance, if we need to renew a contract to, uh, so we subcontract out some tree trimming. So if it's just a renewal, hey, renew contract with you know company XYZ who does this tree trimming, or uh, pay a consultant five thousand dollars to update the software of the wastewater treatment plan, th this, these things would typically end up on the consent calendar. So with the Gandhi statue, I typically read the main items on Thursday before uh, the Tuesday meeting, and I read more in depth on Friday and Saturday. Saturday, I'll look at the consent items, and on Sunday, I'll look, take a closer look. 
And so I saw this thing for the Gandhi statue. I'm like, mm -hmm. huh, I haven't really heard anything about this. And then uh, I look and it basically says, a local group of people want to uh, fundraise to um, uh, place a statue in uh, Central Park. And they will pay for the cost of the statue and they will pay for the installation cost. So the city it won't cost the city any money. And I thought, well, huh, I haven't really, it's funny, <laughs> I haven't heard anything about this. Normally you hear about things like that. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, you know, it's Gandhi, right? I guess that's fine, <laughs> sure. So as a council, we passed the consent calendar with uh, multiple items, including the Gandhi statue proposal um, as a block. Typically, that's okay. how we do it. So the consent item are moved as a block. So in it's the, not individually. It's right. as the whole, yes. the whole consent. Got and it. so we voted 5-0 and then uh, didn't really think much of it. And then about a month and a half later, I got this email from the organizations of minorities, organization of minorities in India saying, we can't believe you're placing this Gandhi statue. Gandhi was this bad man. And you know, oh. this is a really terrible thing. So I looked at it and it was probably actually worded a little more extreme than that. And I thought, <laughs> hmm, oh well. Uh, we, we get, uh, being on the city council, we get a variety of emails. Some are just super kind of out there, hostile. And then there are others like, you know, the, the paint, um, the road striping in front of my house is really worn out. I wish you would really fix something like that. So Got it. those types of things are like, okay, here, I'm going to respond to you or I'll forward it on to somebody in public so works. Filter through all right. the emails. And so the one from the, the people opposed to Gandhi would just seem kind of out there. And I'm like, come on, it's Gandhi. Like, <laughs> and then they emailed again and I realized like, oh, this is a legitimate group of people. So. I emailed back and I said, well, you know, I'm happy to talk to you uh, about your concerns. And so I mentioned to Rob, uh, Rob Davis, uh, who's the current mayor. And I said, hey, Rob, you know, you know that email that we got uh, complaining about the Gandhi statue, I'm gonna go meet with those folks who wanna go with me. They're like, okay, sure. So we went and uh, he invited us into their house in South Davis and we sat and, you know, the person, uh, so as a background, my knowledge of Gandhi is, fairly limited. Uh, I'm not a Gandhi scholar. And uh, okay. <laughs> my knowledge is based upon probably uh, a couple lines in like a junior high school textbook or something. So they were, you know, they started out saying, well, when Gandhi was in South Africa and listed all these things, and, and then I'm thinking, wait, South Africa? No, India, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gandhi, India. And at that point, I realized that there was this whole, there were several chapters in his life I didn't really know anything about. And some of their comments and claims I, I thought were rather extreme. But the takeaway from it for me was that this actually was, this group of people really had heartfelt, sincere concerns about this idea of the Gandhi statue being placed in Central Park. And you know, I, I'm still a believer and Gandhi has done a lot of really wonderful things. Mm -hmm. So that has not changed. But I, but I sort of got a sense that there was a, a greater depth to this person. And um, right, he's, he's a human. So right. you know, no human is perfect. Uh, but yeah, I felt like they, they really had some sincere concerns and I thought, well, and I, Rob shared those, that view with me and we thought, well, we should actually bring it back to the city council and let's have a fuller discussion. Let people come and let's revisit this issue and let them you know, say what, why they want the statue, why they don't want the statue, and let people be heard. Because I, I think that's an important thing about uh, Davis. We have this public comment period. And I think it's very important for people to feel like they can express their concerns and they will be listened to we don't necessarily have to agree with them and vote their way, but at least they feel like they were heard. And it's not, we just don't do it just for the sake of doing it, but I really try to listen to people and, and try to take that into consideration before I vote. And so I thought it was important. So the likelihood that this group would have been able to speak and would have changed everyone's minds, is probably fairly small, but just the ability to speak in public and feel like they had their, their, their forum. Yeah, to acknowledge their concerns. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 
we uh, so we uh, approached the city manager, talked about how we would like to bring this back. Uh, the people in favor of the statue had done all this work, had done this fundraising, and really excited mm -hmm. about it. Were kind of like, well, wait a minute. Yeah. You approved this in February. Here it is. Let's call it July. I'm using August. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Call it August. <laughs> sometime uh, in the summer. Yeah, sometime. Okay. You know, hey, wait a minute. We've done all these plans. The statue's actually arrived in Davis. You know, what are you guys doing? And so, understandably, they were upset. We met with them, and yeah, they mm -hmm. were upset. And we tried to explain, like, look, this isn't that we are opposed to Gandhi. This is really about this idea that this appears to be a controversial thing, and it would be nice to let people have the venue for them to express their concerns. They weren't completely satisfied with that answer. Uh, and then we got word that the Indian Consul General wanted to come to Davis and talk to us. So from San Francisco, uh, okay, sure. So the Indian Consul General uh, comes to Davis, and uh, Rob and I meet with him uh, at uh, City Hall. And it turns out that the statue was coming directly from the Indian government, that it wasn't sort of this it wasn't local being fundraised. homespun, oh. like, oh, gee, you know, we're just going to fundraise and have the statue. Not to take anything away from that group. I mean, they did fundraise, and they made active efforts to help place the statue. But the statue itself was funded from uh, by the Indian government. And the current Indian government is... Um, Hindu Nationalist Party. Uh, that's who's in charge now. And so it's, they've had this effort of placing Gandhi statues all over the world. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, Davis happened to be one of the places that uh, was, uh, was going to have one of these uh, statues. Anyway, so Rob and I were, uh, we brought the item back to city council in the sense that we, the item came up on the agenda where we asked our colleagues whether they would reconsider uh, the item, whether we would be able to revisit the item. And so during that, we heard commentary uh, from the pro-statue people and the anti-statue people. Ultimately, our colleagues voted uh, three to two, Rob and I were the two vote, to not re-look at the statue. So okay. just sort of status quo, we're not going to go backwards, it's, we already voted on it, it's just gonna move forward as planned. Um, what was interesting at the public comment on that issue was it was almost like they were talking about Gandhi, the, sort of this two different Gandhis. One Gandhi, um, which is the one we're most familiar with, was the person who led nonviolent protests, helped gain Indian independence, um, at some level led this exemplary life mm -hmm. and was very inspirational to people in the West like Martin Luther King and you know, various others about this, the, the power of nonviolence. And okay, so there was that and you're like, I don't disagree with that. Yes. I mean, Gandhi is symbolic and has really inspired people uh, in a very good way. And then there was sort of this other group of people who were looking at the failings of Gandhi as a person, right? So Gandhi was a real you know, person and had some weaknesses. And so they were sort of talking about two different Gandhis, you know, Gandhi the person versus Gandhi the symbol. And I think the majority of people in Davis and throughout the US view Gandhi as the symbol. That's understandable. Um, one of the things that struck me with the people who were opposed to the statue is there were people who were uh, minorities in India based upon religion, and they were also lower caste members uh, uh, in the Hindu religion. And several lower caste people who uh, we used to call uh, untouchables, mm -hmm. you know, really expressed their frustration that somebody who to them represents high caste Hindu, the high caste Hindu sort of system, that this person would be placed in the park because they talked about how they as a lower, uh, as an untouchable or a Dalit in India, were, they were severely constrained in terms of what they could make of themselves 
what their life would look like in India. But in America, they felt like all sorts of possibilities existed for them. And they felt very strongly like this is a really good thing, especially for their children. And what was really, I think, touching was the fact that they referenced their kids. They referenced the fact that here in the US, they weren't bound by this sort of mm -hmm. this caste system. And that having this, this, this symbol or this person that to them represented kind of this caste system was sort of hurtful to them. Yeah. Um, in the end, uh, the statue was installed on October 2nd. I think it would have been nice to let people express their concerns, but ultimately, even at that council meeting where we were discussing whether we should re-look at it, mm -hmm. whether we should place the statue or not, it did serve as a forum for people to express their, uh, their thoughts, both positive and negative. Uh, the statue currently exists in Central Park, and um, at the placement, uh, there were some protests, but uh, thankfully they were nonviolent. I won't say they were exactly civil, but uh, yeah, that's that's the the Gandhi story in kind of a nutshell. Wow, that has a really interesting background that I would have never known about if not for those protests. Right. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's all of the questions I have for today, but thank okay. you for being here. Oh, sure. And thanks to the audience for watching. John will come on again and then ask you a few more questions. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Zoe. Thank you. Okay, good. So, um, Zoe, you look so different. Yeah, thank you. So, um, what surprises you about being on the city council? Um, how little I knew about my community, right? So you live somewhere for, you know, decades or something, and you feel like you know your community. But when you get on the city council, there's so many different things, right? You're sort of like, oh, lighting of the dog park. So oh, wastewater rates for El Macero. Uh, you know, uh, the current water project, we you know, had this sort of uh, water rate battle in terms of, you know, what would be the most appropriate way to set water rates. Uh, we have sort of um, how the parks are funded, uh, what's going on with the pools, uh, what's going on with uh, Cool Davis and our sustainability efforts. I mean, there's sort of all these different dimensions. And whether we realize it or not, in our normal lives, we sort of deal with some subset. And being on the council, you know, the council is sort of the governing, the policy board slash governing body of the city. It's actually the city manager who kind of carries out the policy. But all those things sort of come to us. And uh, it's, uh, you know, the interplay between the school district and the city. We have this thing going on right now about uh, uh, tennis courts. You know, the, uh, you know, just lots of things. So uh, really, that kind of surprised me. I thought, well, you know, Lynn Davis, I kind of know this stuff. And I kind of focused on development issues and peripheral development. And you get in there, and you're like, uh, oh, one of the first things, one of my first meetings was uh, somebody from the US Department of Agriculture went and shot a coyote in North Davis, right? So shot the coyote, the neighbors came forward, and you know they loved the coyote. And the coyote, that we think, might have had little uh, pups. And where are the pups? And you're know, like, huh. When I was running for office, I wasn't thinking like, I'm going to deal with a USDA uh, person who goes and like shoots a coyote uh, just running uh, out on the green belt. Uh, we actually uh, canceled the contract with the USDA over that. Uh, but yeah, it's something along those lines, which was really uh, realizing how much more to the city there was. Uh, yeah, that was kind of a big surprise. So there's um, the, the evolution of the city of Davis since World War II has been growth and then less growth and then limited growth, and then at this point, virtually no growth. Yeah. Um, between Measure J and Measure R, the likelihood that another project is going to be approved on the periphery of Davis is pretty slim. The Nishi campaign was an attempt. The fact that all five members of the city council and most of the establishment supported the Nishi project to a certain extent reflects that it was vetted by the city political process. 
it was as close as the citizens could come to having something that everybody in the establishment said, we support this project. And it lost by a very narrow margin. I think that the traffic conflict, and it, I live on Olive Drive, sure. and it's Richard and Olive, so I deal with it every day. But I have a bicycle. I don't have a car. So I don't have to worry about most of the congestion. Um, the the there are enormous problems facing the city of Davis that I think we're not dealing with. But I think that they're, I'm segueing to what I really want to talk about. So the, the American economy is based on false premise. We're $600 billion in trade deficit every year going back to 93. That's a long time. We, we owe the Chinese government over $2 trillion as the people of the United States. If we were actually being responsible, we wouldn't be spending all the money we're, sp we're spending because we don't have it. We exported in California $12 trillion in exports to China. We imported $128 billion in imports from China. That's how irresponsible the American economy is. We have. The pension problems that the city is facing, every municipal government is facing, every state government is facing, and the federal government is in deficit. So from my standpoint, the answer is we need to go to daily reporting, that, that we're so out of touch with the future that we're out of touch with the present. So from my standpoint, the most exciting thing that Brad talked to Zoe about was operations research, because that's what I think we need to do with the city of Davis. I think there's a complete incongruence between what the city staff does and what the city council thinks. I think we need to get that in adjustment. But it's also a problem at the national level. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are proof that the establishment does not have a majority behind it. The, the social contract is in real trouble. We're having a lot of problems with our government and how the economy works. So from the standpoint of making sure that the lights get turned on at night, that the roads get paved, we're losing sight of the future. We just, the, the people that supported Julie Partansky 25 years ago are people that want Davis to be smaller. And I think that we're going to have to change. So if, I mean, at that point, I have a whole bunch of ideas about changing, but they're from the standpoint of a bicyclist. And I think that we can go in different directions that are more sustainable. So with that tirade, <laughs> What do you think Davis should do to become more sustainable? So sustainability, I mean, we can talk about sort of greenhouse gas sustainability, you know, environmental sustainability, things like that. I think you touched upon one area which to me is, uh, you know, I might get in trouble for saying this, but I, I think is as pressing, well, Let's call them. They're tied for tied for tied with each other. One is sort of the environmental sustainability. You know, Davis is a small town. Um, I think we can play a role in making environmental sustainability uh, woven into what we do and sort of lead by example. So this is an important thing. So our role in this is not only for our own community but also uh, in the region and just in other areas, right? So. People take inspiration, just like we take inspiration from people. What's people do in Boulder and Berkeley and Santa Monica or you know wherever, like Portland. So I think I think that's a very very important piece. I think we have this uh, great organization, Cool Davis. We have a lot of people volunteering and really helping us push forward. And the council has an important role there too. So we passed a residential solar requirement. So any new residential construction has to have photovoltaic solar um, incorporated on each unit. Uh, I think we're pretty close to having something similar for uh, commercial. So these are important things that we can do. Uh, but what I was going to say is I think the, the financial situation is also really important. And it's not something that can really, to a lesser extent, volunteers will 
play probably a smaller role. I mean, this is something that the council really needs to wrestle with. Obviously, volunteers are helpful in whatever things we do and what activities we're involved with. Um, but I think in terms of getting our financial situation in order, that kind of falls on the laps of the city council. So I think you know there have been several large factors that have played into that. Uh, I think over generous uh, assumptions about what CalPERS was able to deliver in terms of uh, pension um, investments, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, let's see what, what year are we in. You know, CalPERS would say, oh, you know, we are doing so well in the investment area. 2008 was the year that matters. So eight years ago and anything before that, CalPERS looked pretty good. Yeah, I mean, they sort of said, well, you know, we're doing so well that you won't even have to fund your pension costs. You know, don't worry about it. Even if you let people retire early and give them a little bit better pension, hey, we're doing so awesome. You know, our projections show that you might not even have to contribute at all. Well, those assumptions kind of crashed and burned. So now we're sort of left with this situation, which, um, depending on how you look at it, either it's, well, let's call it unsustainable at some level. So there's that. There's just kind of the global situation or the national situation with low interest rates and things like that. We, um, you know, in California, we have uh, Prop 13. We also have a state that decides to sort of take away funding from local municipalities and maybe put a little back. So we have this situation where road repairs, hey, that's, that's up to you in the city. You know, good luck. Whereas the state was uh, more of an active partner in helping us fund road repair costs. But as the economy went bad and the state finances went bad, a lot of the things they would do prior to that for many, many decades where they would help fund local municipalities and counties, that funding disappeared. So on the one hand, the state budget looks like it's balanced. Oh, but we don't fund these things like we used to. And we see that also with the school district, right? We, uh, right now we have Measure H, and you know, there's this active campaign, and um, I'm supportive of Measure H. Because you look and you see how the state has retreated in terms of the funding for school districts like our own. And you know, schools are important, right? So anyway, the, the city is kind of caught in this situation where the funding has sort of disappeared at some level from the state, where the assumptions that help create over promises to f current and former employees, uh, you know, we are in kind of a pickle. And so I think what we're not going to be able to do is really kind of right the ship or, you know, make a change, you know, one to two or three year change that fixes things. This is sort of a 20 to 30 year process. Uh, it didn't take us that long to get into this trouble, but it's going to take us that long to dig out of it. And the way I kind of think of it is, maybe rightly or wrongly, is it's almost as if we've purchased a, a home or we have this 30-year mortgage. And so we need to make sure, it's called a 30-year mortgage with an adjustable uh, interest rate. We need to make sure that we're able to make those payments and stay current because if we aren't, then the balloon, the d disaster strikes. And so we have to make sure that we're able to do that. That doesn't mean you pay off your 30-year mortgage in four years but it means that you have to be adaptable enough so that you're able to make that, those payments, and those payments are sort of towards our pension obligations, towards our retiree benefits that have already been promised and legally we're obligated to pay, and also road repairs. So as we let our roads deteriorate, the bill will come due ultimately, and the longer we wait on those repairs, the more expensive it is. And so we have to be able to do that and keeping in mind that Let's call that 20 to 30 year horizon. So we have to be sensible. We can't overspend. Uh, we can't panic because this is, you know, we have a way forward, but it's a 20 to 30 year solution. So part of the thing about your daily report is I'm sort of a believer in something similar to that, which is greater transparency. Right now, if you were to go on the city's website and you want to learn about the budget and unfunded liabilities, it's kind of it's kind of hard to get that information aggregated in a way that sort of makes sense. I think we need to be better about sharing the true financial picture of the city with the citizens and being able to update it. So the past couple of years, we've had better than expected uh, sales tax receipts, uh, better than expected property tax receipts. 
Um, how does that relate to kind of that big 30-year sort of uh, you know, problem that we're trying to work on? And so I think if people kind of the community knew what the problem is, the scale of the problem, and what we're doing to work on it, that would be helpful. Because what it would create is this whole extra set of eyes on the city to help make sure we do something responsible. And responsible is not only how we uh, determine that we spend the money, but in terms of what projects we approve and what projects we don't approve. And um, you talked about Measure J and Measure R. People rightfully are skeptical about some of these development proposals because in the past, I don't think we've asked the developers to pay their fair share of um, the externalities of the problems that they necessarily bring. The consequences. And so people are a little bit skeptical. You know, I, uh, uh, you know, when Zoe's first question was telling, uh, was asking a little bit about myself, I talked about I was in a Measure X, New Ancovo Village. You know, so I, I get that skepticism on development. And um, the Nishi project, you know, people can agree with my views or disagree, that, that's fine. But I think when people talk to me about it, it wasn't, oh, well, I'm pals with the developer, so we're just going to give them a blank check. It was for some very specific reasons why I thought the net positive uh, outweighed uh, the negatives uh, to the community. It was, it was a mixed blessing. Uh, the project, you know, so it wasn't all good, it wasn't all bad. I think the community needs to see that we are looking at things more objectively from the big picture, not, oh, well, it's good for the developer, so therefore it's good for Davis, but no. How does this affect our community? And there are some trade-offs. You know, and a good example is, um, do we really want to be sort of this sort of Monterey type of thing where everything is super expensive and sort of regular people can't afford to live here. I don't know, right? I mean, there's some trade-offs there. If this becomes sort of just expensive bedroom community and the students are, you know, it's kind of squished, uh, you know, eight students per uh, one-bedroom apartment or squished, you know, 10 to 12 people in a uh, single-family residence. Uh, you know, we need to think about that. I mean, we have this sort of creative class of people, the 20-somethings and 30-somethings, who bring a lot of energy to the community and... Uh, bring a lot of interesting things. Um, there's nothing wrong with being kind of a sleepy, expensive retirement zone. Maybe that's kind of an overstatement. But, but I mean, there's that sort of path. And then there's sort of the crazy, and uh, apologies to Elk Grove, but you know, we don't want to just go like, hey, just build it. Go for it. And then just like, becomes this you know, double, triple your population over a 10-year period. And what, where is the soul of Davis? What are we trying to do? So. I think we kind of need to come up with a thoughtful approach where people feel like we're headed more or less in the right direction. And then they'll be a little bit more willing to be open to some possibilities. So the AARP, the retired people, did a list of the top 10 places for retired people to go to. And every one of them was a college town, Eugene and Arbor, Davis was number eight on the list. The support system that students need is the same support system that retired people need. It's, you know, and part of it is your, your, um, your logistics, your community is compacted. Because with older people, you're not quite as active. And with younger people, you're so distracted by what you're doing that you don't really care about most of the in-between things. Um, Davis is unique and special. I'm going to wrap up the show now. Sure. Um, I've, I'm organizing something called the Davis Community Building Process. There's a website. It's called daviscommunitybuilding.net. The idea is that the city is so big that it's hard to manage for citizens. I talk about the difference between a bird's eye view and a worm's eye view. The people from the city have a great bird's eye view of the whole city, but they don't have a worm's eye view of what it means to be alive in Davis because they're looking at the whole thing. I think that the idea of a community, and I think Davis has like 12 communities, but the, the place where you shop for groceries defines your community, and each of us has our own physical community based on where we live, where we work, and where we shop. 
where we recreate, where we go to school. Nobody lives in all of Davis. Everybody lives in part of Davis. And I think the, the politics can better reflect that. I'm advocating that Davis become a charter city in the next year and a half. So if you're interested in that, go to the website davischommunitybuildingprocess.net. I want to thank you for being on our show, Brett. Oh, sure. Our, Thanks for having me. Our guest on November the 2nd will be the ASUCD student body president, Alex Lee. He's interested in cities, so we're going to talk some about urbanology. Um, I'm really interested to find out what he has to say. And then on the 9th of November, we're going to have interim UCD Chancellor Ralph Hexter, and he's going to make a pitch to become the permanent chancellor at UC Davis. So we're not going to ask him any hardball questions, but you'll get a chance to see if you think he's good enough. So thanks for being on our show. Sure. This has been What's Going On. Thanks for watching. Good evening.